This is a brief overview of the NetSport Manager control software. As you'll see, the main control application is broken down into three distinct areas. At the top, we have our toolbar providing access to all of the functionality within the product. Down the left-hand side, we have our hierarchical tree view, as well as our tabs to jump between different levels of functionality, including browsing the network, viewing help requests, remote networks, and more. And in the main center area of the screen, we have the icons representing each of the PCs that have been discovered on the network and are available for remote control. We're going to talk through some of the key features available within NetSport Manager so that you can see some of the capabilities of the product. So, where do we begin? In this example, we've already browsed the network and we have a list of computers that have been presented to us on the screen. As you can see, each computer icon conveniently overlays with an operating system indicator so we can identify Windows XP versus, for example, a Linux Fedora system, an Ubuntu system, a Mac, and so on. Now, in order to find and connect to a PC, we have a number of different mechanisms. The simple option is to use the Client Connect menu, and that will allow us to connect to that PC. Of course, we could have simply selected from the menu here, right-click, connect, and disconnect, like so. If we want to actually find some computers, we have the option to select Browse, and Browse will allow us to do exactly as it suggests. Browse the network, either for a particular PC name or partial name, and return back a list of computers that have been located. On the list view we see on the left-hand side, you'll notice we have some groups. And conveniently, NetSport automatically groups computers by their operating system for you in advance. So here we can quickly jump to machines that meet a certain platform specification. In terms of functionality, we already have computer AJK1 identified. So again, right-click and connect, and that computer is available to us. Once available, we obviously want to review some of the functionality that we can perform on that machine. If we jump down the list here to our Active tab, you'll see now that we have a real-time thumbnail of PC AJK1. It now has confirmed its IP address and that it's a Windows XP system. If I mouse over that PC, you'll see I zoom into a larger interactive thumbnail. This becomes beneficial down the line when we start looking at multiple computers being monitored simultaneously. So now we have this computer available, what can we do? Well, as you'd expect, the foundation of NetSport Manager is PC remote control, and so we can right-click and we can view that computer. Here we have that PC, and when we connect by default, we'll disable the background wallpaper to reduce video traffic being sent back. Everything that we talk about within the product is configurable to suit your own personal requirements. So now we have a remote control session, and as you can see, we can interact with the PC as if we were sat physically at the machine. We also have a range of tools available to us at the top of the screen. We have the ability to optimize the remote control color depth that's being sent. Again, by default, we'll control in true color, but there may be occasions over slow remote connections where a 256 color or less view is sufficient and allows you to get maximum performance over the connection. We also have a range of view modes, share, watch, and control. In simple terms, share allows both users from the control and client side to retain mouse and keyboard usage. Watch mode is exactly as it suggests. We can watch the remote screen, but we have no ability to interact. And control mode allows us to take control of a remote PC, and during that control session, the remote PC's mouse and keyboard are locked. This prevents other users interacting with the desktop whilst system updates, for example, are being maintained. Now, not every PC operates at the same resolution, and so our scale to fit mode simply allows us to scale the screen to fit on the available view space, particularly useful when we're remote controlling very high resolution monitors or computers that are multi desktop. Full screen mode allows us to view the system full screen on our desktop. There are occasions where we're performing updates where we might want to take a, a quick screen capture so we have a record visually of any messages that have been reported on the computer. We have some inventory, file transfer, chat mechanisms, as well as an execute command that allows us to launch applications remotely on the computer without going through the traditional navigation process. Clipboard, audio monitoring so that we can chat and interact with the remote user, as well as some assistant tools including logout, reboot, blank screen, 
and screen annotation so we can highlight certain areas of the screen that are relevant to the user. We'll go through some of these in detail as we progress through this tour, but for now let's close our remote session and have a look at some of the system management tools available to us. So we have a remote PC and the user has reported to us that they have particular problems utilizing that computer. The first barrier for us is to understand fully what that computer is, what hardware and what software is being used on the computer. So we can either utilize the quick access button here for inventory or use the main button here. When we select inventory, you'll see it pulls up a summary for the remote computer, giving us a detailed system overview, details of the motherboard, processor, network settings, video adapter, storage, as well as miscellaneous devices that are attached to the computer. So we're able to gather a very clear picture of the computer and what we're dealing with. We can jump to software mode, which allows us to see a full installation history of all software currently installed on the computer and what version each application is. We can quickly review which hotfixes have been installed on the computer, make sure the computer is up to date and secure. We can see current applications that are running. We can review the processes in real time on the remote computer as well as interact with those. And finally, we can also see a detailed summary of all of the services. And again, security permitting, for all the services we can interact, stop, restart and pause those services. So very quickly, NetSport Manager gives us a one-click solution for managing the remote hardware and configuration of the computer. Now, of course, there are times when that provides us with information that means that we need to be more hands-on with the computer. So in addition, we could remote control and view a remote command prompt of the computer. Again, much quicker than automatically having to go to the screen and load a remote command prompt. And if we run an I a quick IP config, you'll see as if we were on the local PC, we're able to perform local DOS functionality from afar. We can also, at the same time, is performing our remote command prompt, we can jump across here and as you can see we can perform a remote registry editor of the computer. So we can jump down, look at software that's installed on the computer, in this case NetSport Manager, and we can see all of the registry edi editor features that are available to us. We can edit, delete and compare all of the settings within the registry, again as if we were at the local computer. There are also going to be occasions where we need to move data between the control computer and our remote client PC. So NetSport Manager provides file transfer, allowing us to view our local computer's file structure, including all of our map network drives, and the remote computer. On the remote computer, as you can see, we can expand and we can navigate that computer as if we were physically sat at the machine. And when we want to transfer files, we can select individual documents that are available to us and drag and drop them backwards and forwards as you would expect. So should we wish to copy this file, we can simply drag and copy to the remote location. Now everything we've done so far has been on a one-to-one -one basis, but the key to NetSport Manager is its one-to-many capabilities. So let's jump back to our all computers, and you'll see here we've got quite an extensive list of machines that are available to us. Perhaps we should select a few additional machines, AJK2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and of course our first computer we've been using. Now those computers we can now add to a group. So let's create a new group, and we'll call it NetSupport, and we're done. So as you'll see, we now have a group called NetSupport available to us here as well. Now one of the nice things about having a hierarchical structure is that we can select individual computers, maybe connect to AJK2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, as shown. And then jumping to our active tab here, you'll see we've got a real-time view of all of those desktop computers. Along the top here, we can set the frequency that these thumbnails update, and we can also adjust the size of them. So here we've now got eight computers that we can monitor and interact with in real time. Again, for each thumbnail, based on the size, we have our quick access points where we can jump to a command prompt or inventory for each and every computer. And again, we have the same range of system management tools available to us. 
perhaps again subtly different, when we go to File, we now have File Distribution Mode. File Distribution Mode now allows us to copy files from our target PC to all of our remote computers in a single action. And again, we can control the destination directory where those updates um, are sent to. Particularly useful if we want to send out um, common documentation to a sales team or push out update files to all computers within a group or department. Given that NetSport Manager is built around the one-to-many concept, you can appreciate now as we bring these thumbnails smaller the benefit of being able to zoom in quickly and easily on any specific PC to keep an eye on activity for each of those computers. You'll also notice at the top here we have a recent bar which is showing us the most recent computers we've connected to. If we click on one, you'll see we've actually got some quick access information again from this toolbar. So wherever you are within the product, NetSport Manager ensures that all of the key functionality is only a single click away. In order to communicate with our group, we both have message and chat capabilities. So under our actions option, you'll see we can send a message to all available clients. And within this here, we can say, test message. And we can also choose to show that message for a duration before it automatically disappears. And if we send that message, you'll see that very quickly across all these computers, the message has now been displayed on their screens. So a quick and simple way for us to actually get key system messages out to all of our user base. Now, of course, the concept of remote control is exactly that, the ability to connect and view a remote computer and control it as if you were there. But there are times where you actually want to use remote control in reverse, where you can send your screen to a remote user and engage in training and in instructional services and tools. So within NetSport Manager, we also have the ability to not only view a screen, but show our screen to any number of selected computers. So perhaps the sales team can all be shown how to use the latest CRM software on the fly before it's deployed out to their computers. We can set a scan that will automatically rotate around any number of connected computers so that we can keep an eye on screen updates or information. We also have the ability to record the remote control session and then play it back later. This is a great way for a service desk of building up pre-recorded solutions to common problems that users report. In terms of base PC management, under our Manage tab, you'll see that we can also remotely reboot, log out and log in computers, as well as send a control delete. And of course, first thing in the morning, or if system updates are required over the weekend, we also have remote power on and power off built into the product as standard. Everything we've seen so far has been interacting with computers across our local network. And of course, this is where NetSport Manager excels. But there are also occasions where you want to manage a mobile workforce or computers that are located on different sites. With that in mind, NetSport also includes an Internet Gateway component. Internet Gateway is a piece of software that can be installed on any selected computer and can be used as an HTTP-based connection point for controls and clients across the network. In a simple scenario, your sales team have their laptops with the NetSport Manager client installed. When they're off-site, their client can report back to an internet gateway, ensuring that connectivity can be available to you at any point of time. Here we have a gateway, like so, and we can browse the gateway. And you'll see here we've found these computers. Now you'll note the distinction here that they have the little gateway icon indicating that these computers are now being monitored and can be connected to utilizing HTTP transport rather than TCP IP. Now many products are, are available that offer a pseudo gateway component but require your data to be routed via a third party service for use. NetSport Manager is unique in offering a gateway that you can install within your own local enterprise at no additional cost and still allow you to manage computers that are outside of your normal network environment. Communication is key as part of utilizing a remote support tool. So NetSport Manager also includes the ability for the end user to send help requests. Let's jump to this computer. 
and imagine that we were the end user for a second. You'll see they have a NetSupport Manager client, and here they can either request a chat for a discussion with an operator, perhaps because they want to report a particular issue, or more importantly, they can go here and they can request help. So you can see they can enter their name and a message, help, my PC is not working. Not a particularly helpful description, but often that's what you'll get from an end user, and that message can be sent through. Now if we look across here, you'll see under our help requests, we can quickly get a summary of any that have been sent by an end user. So the advantage of the solution, this solution is simply that users can build up quick requests for assistance that are then flagged and available to any available control operator. We'll come on in the finer points of the product when we look at configuration with how these help requests can be directed to specific individuals depending on the type of problem that's being reported. This can help spread workload and also allow NetSport to be integrated within your existing service desk solution. Let's jump back to our all computer summary. Okay, so we're back at our main desktop and you can see we have an indicator of the computers that we're currently connected to, denoted by their green computer screens. We also have the ability here to control whether how we sort our computers and also how they're displayed, large icons, small icons, list views, as well as being able to sort. So we could sort by transport, for example, um, or we could sort by their um, client platform, description, or status. So by status, you'll see our connected computers are displayed first on the list. And of course, we can always reference our groups here if we want to manage just specific computers within a given department. You'll also notice over here we have a couple of other extra options that I've not covered. So we have vPro management available to us, where we can connect to vPro enabled chipset computers. We can remotely manage those computers from power on to BIOS configuration right the way through to screen remote control once they're logged in. We also, for legacy networks, support remote networks, which could be dial-in. Traditionally, that would have been a modem, but more frequently now that would might be ISDN. Um, and although a legacy technology, it's still quite prevalent in manufacturing for remote management of manufacturing machinery and equipment. We also have an automation mode, which allows us to create scripts. Scripts become a, a set of commands that are used to automate the process of connecting to a computer, checking for certain values and reporting back. Something very simple like connecting on a routine basis to computers, checking for changes to a certain file, and if the file has changed, to bring a copy of that back. Again, that could be used, for example, in the retail sector, where people want to bring back their POS summary each day from their trading database. As a final summary before we move on to some of the system configurations that are available within the product, let's jump and view one of our computers again, PC number two here. And you remember we talked about some of the different functionality that's available. Let's cover some of those in detail. So whilst I'm working with a remote user, you'll see I have an audio tab here that allows me to talk, listen, or conduct a two-way audio conversation with the remote user whilst I'm undertaking a remote control session. You'll see I have an annotate tool here where I can adjust my settings and colors. And for the tool, I shall use my pen tool. And you'll see I now have the ability to interact on the remote screen and indicate to a user any particular feature or function I want to draw their attention to. You'll also see I have a remote clipboard here, which allows me to send and receive the clipboard contents, either from the remote machine or from my machine. Particularly handy if we want to capture a long URL from a remote PC or some text from an error message that's displayed. You'll also notice the execute button that we utilize. Now execute simply allows us to run an application remotely without needing to view the screen and then navigate through the menu structure. So let's pop up execute type in a simple application name, notepad.exe, and you'll see as soon as we send execute, the application is opened remotely. Now if you utilize this feature in addition to something like file transfer, you'll see very quickly you have the ability to distribute a setup file to any number of connected computers and then send a single instruction to all computers to execute that file. Used in conjunction those two features, becomes a very powerful tool for system management and maintenance. 
Okay, we'll close that view window, take us back to our desktop, and that concludes a very quick overview of some of the key features in NetSport Manager. The next part of this tour will take us through some of the configuration options, both from the client side as well as for the operator control side. Okay, let's look at the configuration options available for the NetSport Manager client. To recap, the client software is installed on each and every device that you wish to perform remote control on. I've made a shortcut on my desktop here, so let's open the configurator and you'll see we're presented with two options, both a basic and advanced editor. As I suggest, the basic editor gives us just simple configuration options, whereas the advanced editor allows us to be much more specific in the configuration we want. So let's open the advanced editor and we'll edit the master profile. It's worth noting at this point that multiple profiles can exist, so different functionality can be available depending on which users are connecting to the computer. You'll see here now we have our master configuration and the top section entitled connectivity provides us with the ability to configure our client based on different network transports. So most commonly TCP IP where we can specify the port number that the product will communicate over. For legacy environments we have support for IPX and NetBIOS networks and if we wish to utilize our gateway component the component that allows us to remotely control computers that are outside of our network over the internet, we need to enable HTTP where we specify the address of our gateway software that we've installed and where appropriate we can specify a security key that controls access to that gateway by both the client and the control software. We also have support here for legacy communications as well as some advanced setups. Perhaps the key area most people will be interested in is looking at the security functionality. So the first area we have is user validation, the ability for us to limit which users have access to this client machine. And you'll see here we can create a dialogue here where we can add specific users. Now these users can either be manually entered usernames and passwords or they can be linked back to our domain authentication via Active Directory. Here you'll see the domain authentication for our usernames and passwords, as well as linking straight specifically back into AD. We can also ensure that we're always prompted for usernames and passwords. So first level of security, specifying users and, and their passwords for who can connect to this computer, and rather than having to maintain this in a manual process, giving the product the ability to link back to our existing domain um, user profiles that already exist. Once we've controlled who has access to this remote control client, we might also want to control privileges. And you'll note at this point here that all of the key features available in NetSport Manager can be enabled or disabled, either on a single client basis or across all clients as a whole. Again, in this case here, none are enabled, but if we wanted to, we could disable the ability to reboot or, or um, log off a computer, and similarly we can control whether they have full access when they're doing that inventory view to our service and application management. We can also specify user acknowledgement. User acknowledgement is simply a warning that is presented on the end user's PC at the point where somebody initiates a remote control session. This could be very handy if you're in the finance department and when a technician is about to connect you have current payroll information available on your screen for example. So it gives you an opportunity to close down any sensitive information before you acknowledge and accept that connection. Worth looking at some of the more subtle points which is if you've chosen to use user acknowledgement you can also override that except when there's nobody logged on clearly there'll be nobody there to acknowledge um, or when you're connecting as the current logged on user in other words you're using the same credentials as the, the machine that you're connecting to. We also have here um, smart card support so for those enterprises that utilize smart cards net support has full support for passing authentication through from a remote smart card reader we have the ability to control connections from specific ad ip address ranges so as an additional layer of security you can specify only specific machines that have the ability to connect to you you can also apply a security key and the NetSport Manager security key, in essence, allows you to make your copy of NetSport Manager unique to your organization. So irrespective of the other security measures in place, only controls and clients carrying the same security key will be compatible. We can also force encryption, 
and allow more than one control to connect at a time. Now that may seem like a, a recipe for multiple users fighting over mouse and keyboard control, but bearing in mind that NetSupport Manager allows computers to watch only, this can be a really useful feature where a number of staff in the department could all connect and be watching a single PC screen at the same time. It might be the latest share information, stock news, or other data that you want a team to have access to view um, simultaneously. Disconnect mode. Disconnect mode simply forces some behavior at the point where a remote control session is terminated. So we can make sure, for example, that when you disconnect, the machine is automatically locked or logged off if the machine was logged on at the point where you connected or restarted. Again, these features are really made to ensure that if a user has performed some remote control on, say, a server and disconnects, um, the machine isn't left in a vulnerable um, unsecured state if the user's forgotten to actually perform a remote logout at that time. We can obviously protect this configuration so once we've decided what we want as our security and functionality defined we can make sure that nobody changes that without the right um, authorization. Within file transfer we can also control not only whether file transfer is available, um, whether we can impersonate the logged on user when we're transferring files, but we can also control which folders and directories that the user has rights to either copy, edit and so on. Similarly with our replay files, replay files being our ability to record a remote control session, we can control how they're named, where they're located and under what user credentials they're provided. Replay files could be used in two different contexts. The most typical is building a library of remote control um, sessions where we've demonstrated how to fix typical problems that users might encounter and those replay files can then be published and made available for the users to review um, in the future. They can also be used within institutions where they have um, requirements, perhaps in the financial sector, to actually keep a recording of each session that has occurred. So, linked to the replay files, we have our um, event logging, and we can enable logging here. And each and every action, whether it's a connection or a function that's performed, will be, will be logged away to an NT event log. We can also log that information to a file in both a primary and a secondary location and if appropriate we can assign that file against a particular user credential. The key from our security point of view is having a permanent record and history of all actions that were undertaken by a member of the support team. Let's jump across to remote control. The configuration options here really control the types of remote control session in terms of the color depth, that's being used for remote control session, whether we want to send physical fonts across. Again, may seem like a rather unusual feature, but if I was remote controlling a PC with a PowerPoint presentation that was using a specific font set, I might want to transfer that font information across. And also I can control when we hook our video to ensure that we maximize the benefit from utilizing DirectX and 3D support. When we do shows, we can choose whether we want to receive a show, whether when a show, which is another PC sending their screen back to me as a presentation or a demonstration, whether I want to receive that full screen or to a window, whether I want it to automatically be scaled to fit, and so on. And finally, audio is where we can control, as it suggests, the threshold and volume levels of our audio support when we're conducting a two-way audio chat between each computer. Our client interface section really controls what's seen by the client so we can enable and disable features like calling, control, chat, replay requests and so on as well as controlling what elements of the client program are visible. You'll notice there's some features in here which are things like quiet mode and silent mode. There are occasions where the existence of the NetSport Manager client needs to be hidden and as part of that process enabling these modes will hide the client from the SysTray and will also remove any screen refreshes that would alert a user that the software is operational and they're being monitored. Conversely, we can also choose to make an audible beep every few seconds to make sure that a user is fully aware that they are being remote controlled. Just skipping one line for a second, the customizable text box also allows us to provide visual on-screen indicators to a user when their PC is being remote controlled. We can customize this text to let them know when somebody is connected to their PC and similarly when somebody is viewing their PC. Finally, we also have the ability to 
maximize how our help requests are directed. You'll see in my previous video, we talked about how a user can simply right click on their client icon and request help. Well, within this scenario here, we can actually define different control users that are available for help and they can begin with descriptions so that perhaps when somebody wants support on database applications they can send the request to one control user for operating system issues to another and again we can, can control hotkeys that are also used to launch help requests rather than just using and relying on the system tray icon. Finally we have profile options here which allows us to control the profile, the settings that are used for the NetSport client depending on the logged on user. And if we have a terminal services or a thin client environment, we can also control how our client is run, what our base port is, and the naming convention that's used for our client. Again, to be specific, NetSport is quite adept and happy working within a thin client environment where you still need the ability to remote control and interact with desktop users even though there may be virtual sessions from a central point. This section covers the NetSport communications gateway. The gateway software can be downloaded and installed as part of a NetSport manager installation and is provided without additional cost. On the screen in front of us you'll see we have the main gateway console running typically on a, a server um, and we have a listing here showing the client computers that are currently connected through the gateway. The concept is that each client as well as being able to communicate over IP has the option to be able to connect to the gateway server and will at regular intervals poll the server looking to see if there are any control computers that wish to establish a connection and remote support. So in this case here we have the eight computers all listed on the gateway and under the active sessions tab you'll see that two of those computers are currently connected by the same computer PC here. Now the gateway typically would be positioned somewhere on the DMZ of a network so that it's accessible for both internal and external computers or of course could be inside the network with something such as NAT set up to port traffic through to the gateway. Let's have a look at the gateway configuration options. So we can select the gateway here and configure. We'll hide that out of the way for a second. And you'll see we're able to control what ports the gateway listens on or particular interfaces for a server with multiple cards as well as where event log information is stored. Naturally, the gateway needs to have the same level of security as the NetSport Manager control and client software. So we can create keys that control which clients and controls are able to connect to the gateway. It's important at this point to note that you can have multiple gateway keys and therefore you can segment your users so that different users can seamlessly communicate through the gateway without being aware of other devices that are also online. We can also control access by operators and again these operators can either be unique to the gateway or can be linked back to um, AD domain usernames and this allows a second level authentication before a user is able to connect and browse the gateway for available computers. A lot of organizations use the NetSport gateway as a means of managing computers that are out on the road, in the field or even for managing multiple different site locations around the country. Um, given the dependency on the gateway, the, the feature is also provides a redundancy option allowing multiple gateways to be available. In this case here, this gateway could be set as a secondary gateway and if the first gateway is unavailable, then automatically the clients will fall back and re-establish their connection onto the secondary gateway. Here we have a summary of a license that's in use. This is telling our gateway that only 200 computers can connect to the gateway at any one time, but you can stack multiple license files within the product um, to ensure that you can manage as many computers as you require. Finally, the security tab simply ensures that we enable encryption on all communications, and if we want to, we can block any computers from connecting if they don't have their encryption um, enabled. And that's pretty much it. The gateway is a key point of Net Support Manager. It's not a requirement for normal LAN and WAN based IP communication, but adds an extra dimension in terms of support for remote users. And at the same time, avoids the need for an organization to sign up to a subscription based service that provides third party gateway services. Um, 
we've certainly seen an increase as net support in organizations that need access to remote computers but are not comfortable with their data being ported via a third party service. Good, well that pretty much covers the gateway. Now we'll have a look at some of the control side configuration op options available in net support. This section of our NetSport Manager overview focuses on the configuration options available for the NetSport Manager control, as we have on screen in front of us here. If we jump to our tools, configuration options, you'll see we have a configuration dialog, which by default has a single standard configuration. Again, at this point, it's important to note that multiple configurations can exist. Each can be password protected and be required at logon by a user. By log on, I mean when a user starts the NetSport Manager control, they'll be asked to select their configuration file, enter their password, and this will control the functionality that's available to that particular user. Let's go into our settings and have a look at the configuration options. So, our starting point is our general identification, the name of the control or control user, and a description, as well as a message to be provided alongside the username during connectivity. If we jump to the connectivity tab, you'll see we have some options for legacy support for remote dial-up, as well as advanced networking specific information, such as tickle periods over the network. Perhaps one of the most important areas is security, where we can specify both a password for our machine, a security key that's used by the control, and if you remember from our earlier presentations, the security key is used to make your copy of NetSport Manager unique. Both the control and client software carries the security key, and this controls connectivity across your network. Anybody who chooses to download an evaluation copy of the software to try will find the eval software will be incompatible with any security key enabled version of the software. Similarly, we have some default settings here for compression and encryption and if we choose encryption you'll see we can control the level of encryption that's utilized across our network. Next up is logging. All the actions that we undertake with the NetSport Manager remote control can be logged to a central file again to keep a full audit trail of all activity and working hand in hand with event logging is the ability to record replay files and potentially audio with those and store those in a given location. Replay files are, very simply, a recording of the screen activity that is undertaken by a user. These recordings can be replayed at a later date or shared with users as common tips and techniques on things to do. User permissions controls whether the operator can act as an administrator and whether they can change settings and configuration of their control itself. Looking at the remote control section, first category is the view mode. Under the view mode, we can control certain settings here, such as whether we're going to switch to full screen, use scale to fit, wallpaper being displayed when we connect to a remote session, video skipping, and so on. These are all options that, out of the box, shouldn't need to be adjusted by a typical user, but we provide the configuration for those that want to be more specific in their video configuration. We can also set our default modes when we connect to a machine, in this case, share mode, or watch or control whether we're going to specify a large cache for our data as well as the maximum color depth that we'll support. You'll notice under the keyboard mouse control that we can also control our keyboard mappings so that if we wish to connect to a remote PC that perhaps is running a different locale, perhaps a German operating system, we can on the fly change our keyboard layout to ensure that we can access all of the region specific characters. We can also customize our hotkeys and performance of our mouse during a remote control session. Print capture is also available. In essence, with print capture, this allows us to remote control a PC, and when we select print on the remote PC, the print output is redirected to our local printer. Enabling this feature allows us to choose the printer we're redirecting to, and where appropriate, specify an individual client printer driver. And as you'd expect, the audio tab allows us to fine tune the audio settings on our PC so that we can conduct two-way chat sessions with our customers. Under the control interface settings, we have a number of settings here to allow us to hide certain aspects of the product, the client list, the groups, the gateways, and so on, as well as make certain list views read-only to prevent um, unwanted editing of company standard documents. 
We can also restrict functionality, and given that the control is profiled and can be given to different users, we can ensure that different users have access to different levels of functionality. It may therefore be that for um, department heads who need to have screen access and interaction ability with their users, that we choose to disable the ability to remotely edit the registry or change key system settings. Help requests are a way for us to control how we react when a user requests help from their NetSupport Manager client. So we can specify here that when a request for help comes in, whether the client is automatically highlighted, whether we display a message on the screen to alert the control user that help has been requested, and also if we choose play an audible sound. We also have an ability here to control our status, so we can choose to be unavailable or busy if we don't want help requests to disturb us at a given time. During file transfer, again, we have the ability here to specify some presets in terms of whether we get confirmations before we copy directories or delete files and so on, um, as well as during delta file transfer, what priorities we set. Delta file transfer for clarity is simply um, the ability for us to compare two files, perhaps a large database file, and only transfer the changes between the two files. Particularly efficient where you may have a master database file being many hundreds of megabytes with only small changes each day to the file. VPro is an available technology for certain chipsets and with VPro enabled machines we're able to connect to them, power them on and remotely control the PC during its BIOS settings and startup. And again depending on the nature of our requirements we can connect either as small business or advanced enterprise mode and we can specify our provisions for access to the Intel vPro chipset. Here's where we control all of the different files that are relevant to NetSupport Manager. The client.nsm list, not surprisingly, contains our list of known clients, group, our groups, and so on. Now, whilst these by default are stored locally on each PC, they can also be saved to a central shared network location, so that if one technician takes the time to create custom groups for the entire organization, those files can be shared by all operators at the same time across the network. And finally, you'll see an option for NetSupport Protect. NetSupport Protect is a companion product that's available from NetSupport that provides desktop lockdown and security. If you use NetSupport Protect and NetSupport Manager, at the point where you create a remote control connection, NetSupport Protect can be suspended so that we don't require you to do any of the on-screen security settings. We can say OK at that point, and you'll see we have the option then to save our configuration or load in a different one. And that pretty much summarizes the configuration options that are provided within the NetSupport Manager control. Suffice to say, everything that we see on screen in terms of our toolbar can be customized and configured to suit our particular requirements. Let's have a look at our toolbar settings. So view, toolbar, customize, and you'll see we're presented with a customization window showing us all the different features that we can add on a high level to our existing toolbar. You'll also see these lines here, which are our separators, which allow us to space out information that's shown above on the main toolbar area. OK. That wraps up our overview of the core NetSupport Manager functionality and configuration options. There are additional resources available for you at www.netsupportmanager.com and as I hope you will be aware, NetSupport Manager is available for download for free evaluation for 30 days from netsupportmanager.com. We hope you found this presentation of interest to you, but we're also very happy as an organization to provide one-to-one -one custom webinars for customers with specific requirements. Thank you.